Did you bring a Bible tonight? Amen. Uh, I had a thought, which sometimes is dangerous, but, um, you know, I, I spend a, a lot of time uh, studying and preparing, and uh, sometimes I'll read scriptures and study the scriptures just, just for myself, just to study it, just to know it a little bit more, and, and God deals with me like he does everybody else. And I uh, put, you know, put a lot of work into what I prepare and things like that. And I, sometimes I'm forgetful and neglectful, I think, sometimes of, of maybe there's something that you have a question on. Or maybe there's a, something in the Bible you were reading and you, was, you saw it a certain way or, or whatever, or just a topic. And so uh, any Wednesday night, I'd say even, even Sunday night, uh, if God lays something on your heart and you just want to bring it to me and say, hey, Pastor, can we talk about this sometime? Man, I'm all, I'm open for that. I really am. And um, I don't always think that everything that I come up with for every service, uh, you know, has to be God's will or else I wouldn't come up with it. Um, uh, and so I want to, I want to feed the people, but I want to feed the people Sometimes what the people want, sometimes what they need, and sometimes I don't always know that. So uh, if you've had something on your mind rolling around in your head all day long, and you'd say, Pastor, I, I don't know, I was, had this question about First Peter, I had this question about Genesis, or I, you know, I was reading something here and I don't understand it, uh, can you help shed some light on it? Uh, so if that's been rolling through your mind today, speak now. And if not, turn to First Peter, okay? <laughs> I mean, I'm, what I'm saying to you is I'll be, I'll be open. I, I really am. And, um, and if, if God has got something, you know, if something's going on in your life or a question came up in your personal study or maybe, uh, you know, somebody in your family was asking you about something and you weren't sure the best way to look at it, the best way to, you know, see it in Scripture or whatever, then bring it up. Bring it to me and say, hey, Pastor, I got something. I had Laura in mind. Believe it or not, I just said... You know, this question's for Laura right here. Yes, ma'am. All right, First Peter chapter... No, I'm just kidding. Uh, turn to First Peter chapter 2, but... When it, when it, I, you know, I, I kind of know a little bit about the situation you're talking about because you shared some things here with me uh, a few weeks ago. And, um, you know, I believe that one of the, there's no doubt that one of the gifts of the Spirit that He gives us, in fact, uh, Laura, turn, you can turn everybody else to, turn Galatians. Let me just read this to you. I'll let God say it better than me. If we're truly saved, and I believe you are, we will manifest the Spirit in our life. And the Spirit of God is not dancing around on top of the pews and swinging from the chandeliers and beating drums and everything else. Um, there are greater manifestations of God in our life than the big show that a lot of churches like to put on. And in Galatians chapter 5, he tells us, he gives us the the works of the flesh and we all know about those and there's 18 of them um, but then there is the nine fruits of the spirit nine is a number for bearing fruit it's you picture a woman who's giving birth she does so after nine months and um, in, in answer to your question the fruit of the spirit is love and I want you to think about the person that you're thinking of okay you know, God's Spirit in me wants me to love them, okay? Number two, God's Spirit in me wants me to have joy in my life and to be able to express that joy. God wants there to be peace in my life, peace with God. Paul said that in as much as possible, be at peace with all men. Now, having said that, that does not mean peace at all costs, okay? That does not mean that. He said as much as possible. And with some people, it's not 
very possible. In fact, it's downright impossible with some people to be at peace with them, okay? But I would say concerning this issue of peace, peace with God is the most important one. And peace with others as much as possible, but peace with yourself, okay? Peace with yourself, which means that you, you have decided that since you're serving God and going to live for God and you have yielded your life over to God, there's no sense in spending a lot of time dwelling on things that you could have done or should have done that you didn't do. I've done that before. Almost to the point of just saying, you know what, I'm, I, can't, I can't do this. The Apostle Paul tells us, forget those things that are behind. Let's press, our, our, our road is ahead, not behind. Okay? And so, try to be at peace with yourself and try to be at peace with other people. Long-suffering. Okay? God long-suffers with us. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Gentleness. So when dealing with, when God deals with us, God does it gently. He does not, God does not strike us down every single time we do something wrong. Okay? Um, I didn't, I didn't just beat and thrash on Courtney every time she did something wrong. Say, say, right, Father. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, in my youth, I thought, well, that's the way to raise them. You know, but God give you a little wisdom, and you just can't beat on your kids every time they do something wrong. To have gentleness with them. Goodness. Okay? That God just gives you this sense of living right. Being good about the things that you do. Being good with other people. Treating other people good. The gift of the Spirit is faith. God wants you to have faith and trust in Him, all right? And I had a, I talked to a, a two, two different ladies today, and I would say that uh, both of them really had a, a real issue with listening to their emotions rather than trusting God. And um, when you listen to your emotions, and even if your emotions are good a certain day, I mean, if you're, if you're doing well a certain day, you can get too much out of that and think, oh, God must be pleased with me. Not necessarily so. So really learning to trust God and trust His Word. And I directed both of them back to the Scriptures. I said, what you need to do is get in your Bible and you need to read it because there, I'm perceiving there's a real light. And these, I've never met these ladies before, don't really know them. But just what they told me on the phone, that's what I, that's what I told them. Meekness. Meekness is not weakness. It is yielding what you think is your right to have everybody bow to you and bow to your will all the time. Okay? Um, Abraham displayed meekness. When it came to that deal with Lot, Lot lost everything. Abraham inherits the entire world, just like Jesus said. Moses was, a, was the Bible says, the most meek man in the world. And when he was being accused by his own sister and his own brother, uh, and it was really uh, Miriam that was running this deal, you know, what, you think God only talks to you? Who do you think you are? And, you know, kind of this nonsense. And Moses was meek. He decided to let God handle it. And even in the face of God was going to strike his sister down, and Moses pled and said, no, don't do that. And God said, you know, I've got to do something here. So, but Moses displayed meekness even in the face of his enemies. And then, um, temperance. Okay, temperance. I hate these other Bibles. They always say self-control here. That is the worst translation in the world of that. It is not self-control. If it was self-controlled, it wouldn't be the fruit of the Spirit. Temperance is just exactly like tempered glass and tempered steel. That has been hardened. It is able to hold up better than it used to be, okay? And, I mean, I can say that, you know, there's no doubt 
that I can hold up to certain things that years ago I couldn't hold up to very well. Okay? That's what God has done in me. He's tempered me. He's kind of brought me through the fire a little bit and cooled me down real quick. <laughs> and not that how it is? We get red hot one day and then God has to cool us down real quick. Well, that's how you get tempered. And uh, those are all displays of God's Spirit being in Laura Wilbur. Okay? So, the person that you're dealing with. This does not mean that you have to be... Uh, a, uh, a doormat for people. It does not mean that you have to uh, fellowship and let's be buddy-buddy to everybody and especially the way they want to live their life. Uh, all of these things that we display to other people, they are not going to display to us. In fact, they're going to display idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, hair, endings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. That's how they're going to be. We don't have to be that way to them. What we, what we kind of want to do is we want to say, well, you're wicked and I'm righteous and I can't have anything to do with you and I, I'm not supposed to be around you and I, you know, I can't let you, um, you know, spoil me or, or defile me in any way. And that's, that's how us religious fundamentalists want to treat people that are wicked and it's not right. Okay? And I know this by experience and practice. Okay? The, oh, I thought that was one of them dogs we had to... Okay. But anyway, it, we're to display these gifts of the Spirit. And if you don't have them in you, don't fake them. If they're not there, they're not there. But God working these things in you, and He'll do one of two things. He'll save your lost loved one, because you have no idea the outcome of their life. God does. So we can't automatically treat somebody just on the condition of how they are today. They may be lost as the devil himself today and be saved, you know, tomorrow. We don't know that. So we display the fruit of the Spirit. We bear the fruit that God manifests in us. Don't fake it because people know the difference. We display and manifest and bear the fruit that God puts in us. And then they'll either be saved as a result of it, or God will use that as judgment against them on Judgment Day. You see what I'm saying? He'll say, now look at Laura's life. Laura did what I told her to do and how I told her to live, and she was an example of righteousness and truth in front of you, and you hated her for it, and you despised her for it, and you mocked her for it, and so... This is where she is. She's in heaven. This is what God did with the rich man that was in hell. He said, you see here Lazarus? He's here at my bosom, isn't he? Okay, see where you are? This is how you ended up. This is because this is how you live your life. And God then will use that as an example to them of why they should have got saved, but they didn't get saved. Does that make, does that make sense to you? Okay? And again, I'm not telling you, be partakers with them, because sh then that's the other extreme. The other extreme is... Well, let's just be as sinful and worldly as the world is, and they'll like us, and if they like us, then they'll want to know Jesus. That's not, they're not going to know the real Jesus. Okay? That little road, I decided to go down for a little while, and God spanked me back out of it and said, we're not going to do that here. Okay? And so, the two extremes, you understand. Okay? But where God wants you is He's going to manifest and display His fruit in you for a reason and for a purpose. So just let God do that. And if He doesn't do it, again, don't fake it. I don't like winning people on what we lied to them about. Let's win them with the truth. Amen? Does that help you any? Okay? See, that was harmless, wasn't it? I'm sorry, one question. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. then, yeah, then let that be, for lack of a better term, let that be the manure that causes you to display brighter fruit. 
You see what I'm saying? Okay? Let their corruption bring forth and manifest greater fruit in you. Okay? And, and say, how do I know if it's the real fruit of the, or if I'm just putting this on myself? Number one, how long it lasts. And number two, how hard it is. Because Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I found that when I'm manifesting what God wants me to manifest in my life, it's as easy as standing up here is. Okay? That's, and, and then how long it lasts. God's fruit lasts a good long time. Okay? But you can only fake something for so long. Okay? Then you bust. All right? First uh, Peter chapter 2. Uh, let's let's kind of tie that in with what you said tonight, all right? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. This is not something, again, as that we as Americans read in our Revolutionary War history manuals. Okay? We don't like the idea of suffering wrongfully. We think we ought to get what we've... He just gets so happy out there, doesn't he? Okay? We, we just have it in our nature to stand up to any sort of injustice done and, and make a big cause out of it, make a big deal about it. But as Christians, there are things that are worth suffering for even if we have to suffer wrongfully. Okay? For what glory is it if... When you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. It's not always persecution when you have a bad day. Sometimes you're just getting back what you got, what you put into it. Or you're getting back what you got coming. Amen? Okay? He said, so what glory is it when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently... This is acceptable with God. Did you ever wonder how people who have had a loved one murdered by some evil person, did you ever wonder how that person could say, we forgive you? We forgive you. Okay? We love you. We don't hold it against you. We forgive you. They were wronged. They, they suffered. They've taken the loss of somebody slain by some evil man for, or whoever for their own purposes. And yet they turn and look at those people and forgive them. I, I, I marvel at people like that. I don't think they're faking. I'm just, I always ask myself, Mike, could you do that? And I, Boy, no, no, not in my flesh. I don't think I could. I think if somebody took my wife's life because they were drunk on the road or they were just a murderer or rapist or whatever, I think I would have a hard time getting through that. I would want, I would want vengeance. I would want to take it out on my own. I would want their blood on my hands. I mean, I, that's just me. I'm, and I'm not a fighter, but to take, some, take somebody's life that was close to me just because you're evil and you wanted to have a little fun in life, that just throws me off, okay? And I would want my vengeance. It would have to be God in me allowing me to suffer that and yet forgive those like Jesus did, like Stephen did. Okay? So he said, um, okay, let's, let's bring that up for a minute. Let's think Stephen here for a minute. What if Stephen would have shouted as they're picking up stones, I have rights! What if he would have made a big scene? Hey, they're, they're perse persecuting me! I, I'm on the side for right. Why don't you come to my aid and defense? What would, what would... Stephen was the very first person slain for the cause of Jesus Christ. Very first one. The first martyr for Christ. Okay? And as they're throwing stones at him, he is like Christ. He is saying, Father, forgive them. Lay not this sin to their charge. And then what does he see right as they're just bashing stones up against his head? What does Stephen get to see? I see Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. He would have, had, he would have lost that. He would have had that taken away. Ain't no telling where his life would have gone after that. Okay? 
So think, of, think about Christ as the example. Where would we be tonight had Christ stood up for his rights and said, Excuse me, I'm the Lord of heaven and earth here, and you're not about to drive no nails in me. I can tell you that right now. Okay? Father, I have rights. What would, where would we be? So, for even hereunto were we called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. His steps. Okay? Now, I believe in liberty. I believe in freedom as an American. I believe in honoring God and the cross and country and the Constitution and the amendments and all of that stuff. And then I believe in them. And I want to say that I would be willing to fight for my liberties and for my freedoms, but not for mine only, but for the freedoms of my children and my grandchildren, my posterity, for the future of America. I would, I would say that, yeah, I think I would join the fight to make sure that we maintain our liberties here in this nation against all enemies, foreign and... But, what if it's more than that at stake what if it's the cause of Jesus Christ and we can say we have a constitutional right to preach this book and to proclaim the gospel to everybody and yet they want to start throwing us in jail I would I'm going to be honest with you I would have to follow in the footsteps of Christ Stephen, Peter, John. Peter after Pentecost, not Peter before Pentecost. Peter before Pentecost reached from the hip and started cutting guys' ears off. Okay? Liberty! Freedom! The American way! Cut his ear off. And Jesus said, put down thy sword, Peter. Peter after Pentecost took the beating. Took a beating from the Sanhedrin and him and John walked out of there thankful that they were counted worthy to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. I would have to follow in Paul's footsteps. Yes, I believe I should be allowed to preach the gospel. If you believe that I sh should have that right taken away, then by all means, you do what you've got to do because I'm going to do what i got to do. But I have to be willing to take the consequences. And... We Americans, we're good at a lot of things, but we're not good at taking consequences very often. Amen? Okay? So, verse, um, he left us an example that you should follow his steps. So, if they want to take away my right to say that sodomy is, a, is an abomination before God and sin is a, is a reproach to any nation, if they want to take that away, then I have to be willing to go to jail for it and to lose my home and us going to lose our tax status and they would take away our building and seize all of our bank accounts. I have to be willing to take all of this for the cause of Christ. Okay? Um, verse 22, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. Lisa will tell you, I literally bite my lip when I've got something that I want to say and I know that I shouldn't say it. I will. I'll be going. Okay? And it's a practice that I had to make myself get into. Because it is, the, it is the, our first instinct and intuition is to argue back. I talked to a person on the phone today that I had to keep saying, please let me finish. Because as I was saying something, boy, they wanted to jump in. And I, I finally, I got quiet and they said, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. But I'm waiting for you to get done. Can I talk now? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I have to practice that. Because it's hard. Okay? So when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. 
who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. Do you think that the Apostle Paul ever remembered that day when Stephen was stoned right in front of him as he's holding the coat? I think every day Paul remembered that. I think he did. I think he saw in Stephen. And, and might it be said that it could very well have been the testimony of Stephen that was in Paul's mind on the road to Damascus. Okay? The Bible doesn't say it. But sometimes you can put two and two together. Okay? That's, and that's just my little piece of theology there. Is that Paul had that on his mind every day. Especially before he was saved. He remembered the face of that man that he hated so much. He wanted to kill him himself instead of just holding the coat. And yet there at the last he forgives those who are killing him. And he looks up and he sees Jesus on the right hand of the Father. I don't think he ever forgot it. So think about your testimony when you're done wrong and you take it. Think about your testimony. Think about who's watching you. Think about who's watching you when somebody does you wrong and you come unglued at them. And you decide they're going to get it back. I'm going to let them have it. They're not going to get away with that. Okay? My wife has had to pull me back, I don't know how many times. Mike, Mike! And at the time, in my anger, I think, well, she's not going to stop me this time. I'm going to do it. Okay? And again, it's our flesh that wants to do that. But the Holy Spirit in us, every one of those fruits of the Spirit that we just read, every one of those tell us that it's better for us to take the wrong and suffer for righteousness sake and let somebody out there see it see the real Christian fundamentalist and what we really believe as opposed to what American fundamentalism has done to the cause of Christ amen because they see us yelling you know that we hate abortion and we hate sodomites and we hate this and we hate that and then they hear that there's a bunch of sodomites and a bunch of fornicators and adulterers and pedophiles and everybody else amongst our midst okay so verse 24 who his own self bear our sins in, in his own body on the tree that we being dead sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes you are healed for you were a sheep going astray but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul in Matthew chapter 26, there's the story here. Um, in just a couple places in Scripture I have for you tonight. Then, next Wednesday, I can't wait till next Wednesday. Because I got, this This something I've always wanted to work on, and I worked on it, and I'm really proud of it, and it probably doesn't mean this much to you, but I really like it. Because you've heard me say that every office and position there is in the Bible, Jesus holds the top position of it. Okay? Prophets. He is the prophet. Capital P. So that's what I did. Because you see there in um, verse 25, he's the shepherd, capital S, and bishop of your soul. He is, right? So I did. I took that and I ran with it. And I did. I thought of everything I could think of. He's the chief. He's the, he's the high priest. He's the, he's, the, he's the priest and yet he's the lamb. Right? Anyway. So that's, that's coming next, next, uh, next week. Matthew 26, 64. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need we have we of witness? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. And I get the, e the comments from YouTube emailed to my email account. So every now and then I'll glance at what everybody's saying about me on YouTube. And what I read today was not very flattering of Mike Hoggard. Okay? 
that I'm nut, nut, what is it, nutter butter. One guy called me, another guy calls me, uh, he says, HOG in capital letters, guard. And like I'm leading everybody astray and I'm going to hell because we're not following the Torah and we're not doing Passover. Stuff like, I mean, it was a long thing. And, and what I wanted to do was, I'm going to set them straight. Okay? So, I didn't. So, what think ye? They answered and said, he's guilty of death. Verse 67, they did spit in his face and buffeted him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands. Hit me is one thing. You spit in my face. That's nasty. Okay? Somebody spit in my face. I'm, that is assault on a police officer. Okay? Because I watched cops live PD. And all you got to do is <clears throat> like that to a cop. You're going in cuffs. And that's a felony. Okay? You can do that to anybody in the world. <clears throat> Okay? She's not having me arrested. You do that to a cop, you're going to go sit in the back of a squad car and you're going to go to jail and you're going to have a criminal record for assaulting a police officer with saliva. Okay? They spit in his face. They buffeted him. They took their hands and they hit him with the palms of their hands. They jack slapped him, we called it. The Old Testament tells us, I never saw this in the Gospel, the Old Testament tells us they pulled the beard off his, off his face, like that. And then, that was what they did inside, when they got him outside. Then they gave him the cat of nine tails, and I mean, they scourged him, and they ripped a hide off his back, and then they mocked him, and they put him on the cross, okay? And not a thing did he do. Not a thing. He let them get away with it. Why? For me, and for George, and for Sasha, and for these kids back here. That's why he did it. Okay? So, um, 1 Corinthians, Mark 16, or 40, 14, 65 says the same thing. But 1 Corinthians 4, look at this very quickly. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. Paul allowed himself to take the... Um, to take the ridicule. Paul allowed himself to take the scourging, to take the prison time, to, to take all of that stuff so that he could continue to write his epistles and make men wise. We are weak, but ye are strong. Paul is the one who fasted, who struggled, who prayed, who sat up making tents all day and preaching all night. Was he tired? You better believe he was. But why did he do it? For God's people to be strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. And look at what, look at what Paul's attitude is. Why did he go through all of this? To make his people better people so that they would, so that they would benefit from his labor. Okay? Verse 11. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted, have no certain dwelling place. And George, I'm too well fed, overpaid. Um, all I have to do is kind of holler down the hallway and any one of these girls come down, Dad, do you need something? Uncle Mike, do you need something? you need lunch? Do you need, do you need some water? Do you need some coffee? Do you need anything? You do that all day long. Um, I'm very well clothed, thank God. Um, and I have not ever been beat up for being a Christian. Never. And I have a nice place to live and it's very comfortable for me and I want to keep living there until the day I die. So I often think about men, both in the past and in this present world, men that I've seen with my eyes in Kenya, Wayne, that do not have it near as well as I do, who do not have the nice drywalled church with the nice ceiling, with the nice air conditioning and heat. Oh, well, they have the heat. Yeah. Um, 
those guys preach their guts out over there. And one pastor asked me, before I left one time, he said, what about tithing? I said, God's people should tithe. He said, Do you, are you paid by your church? I went, yeah. And apparently he wasn't. He had to work full time. And he was out in a, you know, impoverished town. And what tithe they took in, none of it went to him. And I said, to be honest with you, you need to set that straight with your people. That's, that's your labor. And you should be paid for it. But he had been pastoring all these years. And he was a good pastor. Had a good church. But he had been pastoring all these years. Never been, from what I could tell, never been paid for it. And uh, at, that got me. I was like, why, why in the world do I complain about anything that I have or don't have? Okay? And um, so anyway, verse 12, we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled. We bless, being persecuted. We suffer it, being defamed. We entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Now, I praise God that he has given us a president that will not back down the Palestinian Authority. And so far, so far, the choices that he has made concerning issues that are dear to us as Christians, Bible-even Christians, he's made the right ones. Okay? Especially coming out and saying, we're going to build an embassy in Jerusalem, and that's just how it is. Because Donald Trump is not in anybody's pocket. Amen? Okay? And I kind of had that feeling going into this thing that I, I, I don't think he owes anybody any favors. I think everybody owes him the favors. So maybe he'll be different than every other stinking politician we've had in the history of America. Okay? And so far, I mean, even if I didn't like anything else he did, I would praise the man. If he was Barack Obama, I would praise him for putting the the embassy of the United States in Jerusalem. Because that designates that Jerusalem is the rightful capital of the people of Israel. Okay? Now, I said all that to say this. I think we've got to reprieve for a while in this country. But God knows for how long. At some point, Christian favoritism is going to run out in this world. There will be no place to run. And the world is going to hate us and not love us anymore. Or not yield to us. Or not give in to the Christian fundamentalists or the Christian right. Or whatever it is. They're not going to give in to that. They're going to turn against us. And we're going to have to take it. We're going to have to take it. And I'm not looking forward to that. But that's just how it's going to be. And these are the lessons that if you'll practice this today... You won't have a hard time with it 10 years from now or 5 years from now or it could all change next week. Okay? They may shoot Trump and Pence and blow up the whole cabinet and put Hillary in anyway. Okay? That lying bunch. They may do all that next week. Who knows? So I'm just saying it's in the Bible. It's part of the rules of life that we're going to be persecuted at some point for our faith. Okay? Let's not try to shoot everybody that's trying to do it. Let's let it turn and be our testimony. That's what Jesus told us to do. Amen? Let's stand. Somebody give me an office that, that somebody holds in the Bible. Priest! Jesus was not a Levite. How then does he get to be a priest? Higher order. Never dawned on me until I read it in a book one time that Melchizedek was an angel. And I went, oh, that is so cool. I mean, I never... Then teach me that in Bible college, Brother George. They, I must have missed that chapter. Okay? Uh, he's a priest. He's the, he is the high priest. There is no priest higher than Jesus. And that's just it. What I'm going to show you next week is that there is no higher officer than the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? When you holler up to heaven, I want to speak to a supervisor! 
Jesus says, I'm the highest authority here. In fact, the most high authority. Father in heaven, I love you. Jesus, I thank you for doing so far what I have not had to do. I've not had to suffer. I've not I've not lost much of anything in this world. You have given me way too much in the way of earthly comfort, and you've given me way too much in the way of your blessings, your grace, wisdom from your word, and I don't think I've earned any of it. But Father, I believe your word, and I believe that as you suffered, as you were persecuted, as you were despised, as you were spit on, and my forefathers in the faith were, it may come from me also. So Lord, help me to take it the way Peter did, the way Stephen did, the way Paul did, the way Jesus did. Help me to take it that way and not the way that my nature is. And Lord, even now, teach us that lesson that sometimes it's not okay to just run our mouth. It's not okay to just try to win all of everybody's arguments. Lord, teach us how to bite our lip. Teach us how to yield our rights. Teach us how to step back. Teach us how to get in the back of the line. Teach us how to wait on things. Teach us, Father, a lot of things that are uncomfortable for us, but teach them to us all that much more. Because, Father, there are people in this world right now who love you probably way more than I do, that have a lot less and have had to suffer a lot more. And, Father, I admire them, and I look up to them. And I ask you, God, Lord, that you would give us that same grace and same spirit. Bless your people tonight. We love you. We thank you for this book, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.